Okay, again, I apologize for being late. Um, tonight we are pleased to have Stephen Phillips join us. Uh, Stephen is the author of two novels of military fiction, and he's going to speak tonight on his ongoing journey as a writer and talk about his publishing past, both as a commercially published author and with his self publishing experience, which I think we can all relate to. Um, Stephen is a graduate of the Uni uh, United States Naval Academy in 1902 and served in the U.S. Navy as a Special Operations Officer and Explosive Ordnance and Disposal Technician. His debut novel, Proximity, is praised for its exciting and authentic view of life in a military bomb squad. Proximity garnered a gold medal from the Military Writers Society of America. And uh, the Naval Institute Press published even second novel, The Recipient Son, that's set at the U.S. Naval Academy in 1990. It is the story of a young man's struggle to come to terms with his legacy as the son of a war hero and with doubts about his own courage. So we are pleased to have you here and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody, for inviting me to come and speak today to the Annapolis chapter of the uh, Maryland Writers Society. I see some old friends here, like Doug Norton, and I've made some new friends tonight, so I really appreciate that. And I've already been convinced that I should join the chapter, so there it is. That's the, that's the best part of the evening right there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, as she said, I graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1992. I served in the Navy as first a surface warfare officer, and that's basically what most folks think about in the Navy as being a ship driver. Um, I served on two different ships, an LST and then an Aegis cruiser. But from a young age, ironically because of a work of fiction that I had read, Frogman by Rob White, I had always wanted to be a Navy diver. And as I uh, got into the Navy diving community, learned about the explosive ordnance disposal community, and decided to become an EOD technician. And that's basically the military's bomb squad. Uh, people are more familiar today with the EOD field and the acronym IED for Improvised Explosive Device. But during the time that I served, those were not as well known. Uh, it's not a very large community, and for that reason, I decided to write a book to describe to others what life was like in a military bomb squad, what it was like to be an AED EOD technician. One of the things that I encountered, um, as all EOD techs did in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, before 9-11, um, was the fact that people would encounter us and they'd see, you know, a handsome guy, by the way, in cannons, <laughs> and they would say, oh, you must be a Navy SEAL. And we'd say, well, no, I'm a Navy EOD technician. And they'd say, so what does a Navy EOD tech do? And we'd say, well, we dive. And they'd say, okay. And we'd say, we blow up mines. And they said, okay. We fast rope out of planes, we parachute out of uh, aircraft, and they'd say, yeah, 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 you're a Navy SEAL. And we'd say, no, no, we're a bomb squad, we're a Navy EOD. So I decided that I wanted to share that world with folks, and I wanted to do two things. One, for young sailors who were interested in becoming an EOD technician, for them to have something that they could pick up and read and become more familiar with the community and become immersed in it. I also wanted to write something that I could have EOD technicians give to their friends and family members, right? To their mom, to their grandmother, to their girlfriend, and say, hey, if you read this book, you'll understand what it is that I do. So that was my starting motivation for writing the thing. Uh, I then thought about how am I going to write this? Do I write nonfiction? Do I write fiction? And I decided that I would go down the fiction path, in part because uh, I come from a family of storytellers, and we're the folks that sit around on Sunday night and, and tell stories or whatever. So I thought that's, that's the venue that I want to use. I want to do a fiction. And at the time, I didn't necessarily have any exciting tales of my own, and I wasn't necessarily connected into any in the late 90s that I thought people would be interested in. So I decided to go down that route. Another interesting aspect is if you write fiction, the requirements to get the Navy to clear the, the book become much easier if you're not writing about actual operations. Uh, the book still did have to be cleared by the US Navy for publication to make sure that I didn't unwittingly write something about uh, bond disposal procedures and the like. So my intent through this book was to educate and inform readers about what life is like and I made a fictional account of an EOD uh, detachment, Navy EOD detachment, that starts in 1998 
and it, and it ends at about the 2000 time period, about the time of USS Cole. And the reason that that's the time period is, is I was writing it uh, at that time. I started writing this in the summer of 2000, and I finished it in February of 2002. The book wasn't published until 2007 because of the combination of having me get the book clear, which took about seven months, and then my own journey of trying to get it uh, published. In forming the book, what I decided to do was I took my own experiences, uh, write what you know, and I fictionalized them. So for example, the, the bad guys, as it were, in the, in the story, is a group of terrorists that are operating both in the United States and overseas, and it's a joint venture between uh, an Arab Islamist terrorist group and a white supremacist group in the United States. So the actual case that I took was, I was stationed in Nickelside, Texas, which is in the Corpus Christi area near San Patricio County, and we had a uh, memorandum of understanding with the locals, and there was a white supremacist down there that was, he was sort of actually more of a Ted Kaczynski that wanted to attack uh, federal lands and federal officers, and, and we got called into his house, and he had a bomb factory there, but he had not yet acted on it. He had crossed the threshold of actually putting a device out. But he had a manifesto that he had written, and one of the things he wrote about was he was going to attack uh, postal workers. He had maps of all the federal lands in the state of Texas and the like. So I take that guy, I fictionalize him, and then I connect him to an advisor, as it were, that, as I said, is an Islamist that has come from overseas. So that was kind of a, a fun project for me to work on. Um, the book did relatively well. As she said, I garnered a gold medal from the Military Writers Society in 2008. Uh, that led to my second novel, The Recipient's Son, which is published by the Naval Institute Press. So this book is, uh, my starting point was similar to the first one. Uh, folks in this area actually are much more aware of the United States Naval Academy and what it is, and you know, it's part and parcel of the town here. But in my naval career, I found myself in other parts of the country where the Naval Academy was not as well known. So I thought, I would like to write a book that sort of informs folks and educates them about what life is like as a midshipman at the US Naval Academy. And again, in a fictional format, so that it's entertaining to them. And in doing so, I kind of struggled a little bit with what is going to be my plot arc in this thing. And I thought, you know, the tragedy of a service academy book, and there's a couple of them out there, The Return of Philo T. McGiffin by David Poyer, A Sense of Honor by um, Senator Jim Webb. Uh, there's books about other service academies. Uh, there's a couple by, I'm going to get his name wrong, Lucian Truscott, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Dress Gray about West Point. Um, there's uh, Lords of Discipline written by Pat Conroy. So the challenge in each of those books, sort of the tragedy in the plot arc is normally the student is going to get kicked out for some reason. And so I wrestled with, do I follow that plot arc with my student? And I decided that I would do that. And so I'd have my main character struggle through it. And I kind of got to the point where I said to myself, in a detective novel, it's whodunit, right? So I, I finally came to peace with, in a service academy book, is, is, am I going to get kicked out? So then I had to figure out, how do I get the audience to become uh, connected with that character, identify with him, that he becomes sympathetic. And so what I decided to do was, ironically, another technique that I see, it's, it's the joke in my family, it's the Disney movie, I made him an orphan, right? Because that makes the character sympathetic. In all the Disney movies, think about it, they're, except for The Incredibles, they're all orphans, right? It's the only one where the whole family is there. So, in order to do that, the last hook that I put into this character, and his name is Donald Borrego, was that his father is a graduate from the class of 67, and that his father died in the Vietnam War and was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Some of you may or may not know this, but if you're the son or daughter of a Medal of Honor recipient, you in effect have automatic acceptance to the service academy of your choice, provided that you meet all of the other requirements. And when I was there, there was, in fact, one midshipman that fell in that category. She, her father was a Medal of Honor recipient from Vietnam. And so now the story becomes, I can use this character to Donald Torrego to learn to identify with the father that he never had, the father he didn't grow up with, 
by having, ironically or strangely, a shared experience with his father that he's never met 25 years later by going to the same service academy. He then becomes the vehicle for expressing to the audience, to the reader, what it's like to be at the Naval Academy and to have all of those experiences as he struggles and goes through this inner turmoil of, it's not just about getting through the place for me, it's about getting through the place in, in a way to honor my father. So that's how I chose to do that. And then in doing so, I also tried to do something even deeper, and that was, I actually laid out and storyboarded and tried to lace through this story notions of uh, leadership and ethics and honor, because I thought those shall be part and parcel of the story at, of, of the Naval Academy. And in fact, recently, I've been blessed that the phrase that I use with folks is, they're, over there they've been picking up what I've been putting down. The novel is now being used for honor remediation for midshipmen. So if a midshipman has committed an honor offense and is retained, you know, some of them obviously are kicked out. If they're retained, they go through a process with a mentor where they try to understand concepts of honor, ethics, and everything, and they're using this book as part of the vehicle for them to unpack those things. And some of the first feedback that I've gotten is, in the past, they had read uh, scenarios about senior officers, about this certain officer who led to this particular battle, and what some of the mids have said, who have started with that and ended with this, is that they can identify with the midshipman much more because it's, he is what they're experiencing. He's struggling with what they're struggling with right now. So that's, that's kind of rewarding. Um, so I'd like to talk for a moment about sort of my publishing journey and how I got from my first novel to the second one, a, uh, in effect, the phrase I use is independently published book to a traditional publisher. And to do that, I wanted to start with my personal lexicon of the different publishing styles that some of you may agree, disagree, we can debate later, but these are the terms that I use. I consider traditional publishing to be that publishing where the corporate entity assumes the majority of the risk. Uh, they are, in effect, responsible for the success of whatever it is that is published. So it's in their catalog. They put behind it a certain amount of advertising, and marketing, and the like, and they push that thing through. Um, the second category is the self-publishing or vanity publishing. This is where the author assumes all the risk, right? And this is the, I, I write the thing, I've done whatever I can to prepare it, but then I go and I pay on my own for its printing and publishing and trying to get it distributed and the like. But, in today's world, we have a third way that I call independent publishing. And this is where the author does have some investment. The author has some responsibility, but they have minimal risk because the risk is being shared by the printer and the distributor, those who produce and distribute the book. And why are they able to do that? Because of a, a technique that many of you have probably heard of called print on demand, where you print low volumes of books that are of high quality, and because of those small runs and the ability to distribute them through places like Amazon and Barnes & Noble Online, then as a result of that, the author basically is able to find out if they have an audience. And a common phrase that I've used with folks is, I've, I've been in venues where people will experience proximity and they read it, and they're kind of going, oh, you self-published this. And I say, well, no, I, I didn't self-publish it. It's independently published. I said, my first novel is the literary world's version of an independent film, right? And so as an author, I showed some success, and they, I, I demonstrated that so that a traditional publisher said, hey, so we'll take a chance with this guy. So, in writing proximity, um, I think I follow the path that I suspect many people do when they first start to write, and that is, I, I first did not think about uh, the publishing part of this thing. I first thought about the writing thing. And so as I described, I started forming the story. And, and I thought about what characters do I want to have in this and how do I make it exciting? And so there's other characters. The main character is an officer in charge of this DOD detachment. And I realized that I had to create for the audience an understanding of this world of bomb disposal for people who were, again, uninformed. And so I actually start with three characters together 
Uh, the officer, uh, Lieutenant Chad Straczynski, is just finishing up going through the schoolhouse. And the last phase of the schoolhouse is a diving phase. So he's doing diving and he's working on mines. I have another character whose name is Theodore Ball with the nickname T-Ball, a petty officer who's deployed on an aircraft carrier and is assigned to and operating with Navy SEALs. And his mission is doing takedowns of uh, ships in the Northern Arabian Gulf. Then I have a third character who's doing what is more called Firehouse EOD. He's operating out of a shore detachment in Norfolk. And as the story opens, his detachment is called to respond to an emergency at sea where a ship has had a casualty with a missile on board. So they load up on an aircraft at Naval Station Norfolk, fly out, and they have to parachute out into a raft to get recovered by the ship and to do this, this emergency response. And through each of those characters, I give you, the reader, the language of the community. I describe things like the term for the man who puts on the bomb suit and goes down and deals with the device is called the P1, person one. So later on in the book, when I say P1, you're in the language and you know what that means. Or if I say render safe procedure or RSP, you know what it means. And so after introducing you to each of those characters and getting you sort of in this world, I assert that the book starts to pick up in speed a little bit. Because that's also then when we, I introduce you to these bad guys, the terrorists that are attacking folks both home and abroad. And I believe in the FBI, and the, my, maybe my favorite plot twist on this thing is the characters, the EOD detachment encounters the device once in the United States, twice overseas. The third time they encounter it, the FBI thinks somebody in this deck is in on the plot. And the FBI agent's line is to her boss. She says, you know, boss, if this dead found the same device twice, that's, that's a coincidence. If they find it three times, that's evidence. And so that's part of the plot twist as they try to lace in uh, false um, evidence into the, into the investigation to see if one of these guys on the detachment reveals himself to be associated with the bombers. So it was really fun to lay that out. And as I, as I got going, I got past sort of the whole thing of, describing for folks what it's like to be a, a bomb squad guy, and I myself got into the, into the story and driving, it became a lot of fun. And I really worked with each of the characters and tried to develop them and make sure that each of them had depth. I fought with that balance of how many of the guys on the detachment do I introduce the audience to and make them sort of identify with and follow them on their personal journeys, um, and how many of them do I have as sort of, maybe they're only one dimensional, you know? There's a character that primarily what she does is drives the boat, you know, and talks on the radio, and that's about it. So that, that was an interesting process to go through that. So then once I finished it, then I had to say to myself, so is this thing any good, right? I mean, it was my baby, I liked it, but who knows if, if, it, if it's any good or not. And so what I did was I formed a team of personal editors, reviewers, that I could send this thing out to. And by design, some of them were EOD texts, because I wanted them to read it and go, dude, you can't see this, you know, that kind of a thing. You can't tell them that. And I had uh, folks who were in the military that maybe had some familiarity with the EOD world, or at least with life in the military. So for example, I had some scenes with aircraft carriers. I had to have a guy read it and say, yeah, this is accurate, that kind of thing. But then I also had people read it who had no concept of the military whatsoever. As an example, I asked my sister-in-law to read it, and she at the time was an editor of a college newspaper. No concept of life in the military whatsoever. I'm the only person in her extended family that had ever served. And I needed her because uh, she would read sections and say to me, I don't understand what you're writing here, or the military language is getting too thick. Or, I've heard enough about what kind of gun this guy is using, I'm bored now. If you want to hold my attention, you know, tell me one or two things and then move on, you know. And so, I really wanted to do that, of strike the balance so that um, it's a military novel, but not something that only folks that are interested in sort of military by itself would be interested. I wanted to try to garner a larger audience. And another aspect of that is I have the characters' families involved, and there's conflict and turmoil within the families, and I bring that, that through. So I hope that that would create not just depth of the characters, but depth of the story. So what was nice was I, after time, I was getting feedback from a lot of them. In effect, by and large, they were enjoying the story. Everybody was, was, was getting it. And so then I said, so is this thing any good? Maybe I should try to, to send it out and see what's what. And I actually started first by paying an editor in 
the Corpus Christi area, a woman who basically had hung her own shingle out. I think she had been published a couple times, and she was a pretty decent editor, so I actually paid her 500 bucks to re-review the manuscript and do sort of a nice copy editing, format editing and the like, and that really helped. And then I sat down with a Chicago manual style, and I went through the whole thing several times myself and tried to get it to the point where I felt it was packaged, it was ready to go. And then I got into the Navy Diver Mafia, and I found other Navy divers who had been published. And one of them was Dick Couch, who was also a Naval Academy graduate. He's a retired Navy uh, SEAL. He would served in the CIA, and he's written several books about uh, serving in the SEAL teams, both fiction and nonfiction. Most of his are nonfiction. And he read, and he said, Steve, this is good. I'm introducing you to my agent. So I got introduced to his agent, Bob Mekoy, former editor at Crown Books. Bob mostly represents military writers, and he signed, of course, with this first experience, I'm like, this is easy, right? This is, uh, it, was, it was just luck. But unfortunately, my luck uh, ran out. 